Okay. Let me wrap up a point that I was making last time about the last sentences of Ecce Homo, Why I Am So Wise, Section 5. Then, uh, I'll make a point about the first sentence of Why Section 5, and then I'll go back to Why Section 4 and talk a little bit about it. The last thing he says in uh, Why Section 5 is this. If you are rich enough to deal with it, it is even a stroke of luck to be in the wrong. If a god came to earth, he should do, it's very obscure, it, it, if you're rich enough for it to deal with it, it's even a, it could even be a good fortune to be in the wrong. If a god came to earth, he should do nothing but wrong, assuming not the punishment but the guilt, that would be divine. So the idea, so one, it's clear that we're talking about a revaluation of some kind. So the god come to earth here is a reference to the Christian God, Jesus, and what he's suggesting is the overthrow, the revaluation of the meaning of the Christian God, Jesus, and the revaluation should be that the, uh, the God to come, or the revalued God, that's okay, I would never let you know him, that the re, the, the revalued God, and, and there is, the, Nietzsche has a whole, it embraces the ancient Greek mythology of Dionysus. So, but, the, but not as a religious belief, but symbolically. So the, he can extend this uh, uh, parallel, uh, extended metaphor at some length, but we don't have to go into that. But the, uh, the idea is that the revalued God come to earth should do nothing but wrong, taking upon himself not the punishment, but the guilt. That would be divine. So whereas Jesus uh, takes upon himself the punishment uh, and is seen to be divine, Nietzsche says the revalued God would take upon himself the guilt. Jesus takes upon himself the punishment because Jesus is supremely innocent, has not committed original sin, and as a perfectly innocent sacrifice, uh, uh, is pleasing in the eyes of God that he is punished. From Nietzsche's point of view, the frenzy of Christianity is wrapped up in that psychology of the supremely innocent being punished. What could be more unjust? So to become frenzied and full of fury over the injustice of supreme innocence punished is the essential thought of Christianity. That's the essential thought of being wrong. Jesus was the ultimate wronged being. It's the, the, the idea of being wrong pushed to its psychological extreme. Okay? Jesus, Jesus' punishment is the idea of being wrong pushed to its psychological extreme, made so by Jesus' superhuman innocence. Nietzsche says, no. <clears throat> that is, in fact, not a form of divinity but uh, conceals a resentful hatred against the world. What kind of horrible place is the world where supreme innocence suffers punishment? In Christianity, says Nietzsche, I see a curse on the world, a condemnation of the world, the, a, an indictment, a pointing of the finger at the evil of the world. You have punished supreme innocence. You are evil, world. On the opposite side, the God who would revalue that, would take upon himself the guilt. Why? In other words, someone does something wrong to me. Instead of taking the, the attitude of the Christian, I am innocent wrong. I mean, the point has to be that someone does something wrong to me, and I am in the right. So I didn't do anything to deserve that wrong. So the whole the setting is, someone has to have done a wrong to me, and I am, in, I am from the moral point of view, in the right. But what I reject is, says Nietzsche, is any of that, the psychology of that moral point of view that, in, that positions and entrenches me in the thought of being in the right. Instead, I'm going to do just the opposite of the thing that drives Christianity into its frenzied hatred of the world. I am going to say, no, 
The wrong is my fault. Uh, you did not commit a wrong. I am guilty. What I do by fabricating that psychology is erode the existence of that wrong. No wrong was done. No wrong was committed to me. There was no wrong against my innocence. I admit or fabricated in myself, forced it, created in myself artificially a psychology of being guilty for it. Why did he do that? Did he fabricate a psychology of being guilty out of kindness to the other, out of a concept of forgiveness to the other, out of a concept of goodness toward the other? None of that nonsense. Certainly not. Remembering here from his father, somehow that we don't really understand, Nietzsche inherited, somehow that we don't understand the meaning of the word inherited, a compulsive uh, 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 feeling of wanting to strike back in retaliation. Feelings of wanting to strike back burn up life in me. Because how exactly this works, we don't know. Because of the weakness I inherited from my father, I said that I, he says, I inherited an overall weak, weakening of life force. I don't know exactly what the uh, biological meaning of that could be in contemporary biology, but that's what he says as best as he can put it in the terms of the biology of his time. I inherited an overall weakening of life force from my father. The, the weakness, the feelings of weakness, weakness, decaying, deterioration, being already dead, being on the lowest rung on the ladder of life, uh, having a second self that walks along with my other self who, uh, that's in the world, but in a kind of shadowy world, not quite present with the rest of everyone else. All of that weakness creates in me the desire to strike back. Weakness wants to retaliate. It wants to strike back for its weakness. Weak things want to strike back. Weakness wants revenge for its weakness. Now, when Nietzsche speaks of himself as being already dead, a descendant of the lowest rung on the ladder of life, uh, uh, when he says, I, I uh, am a, a double walker who has a foot beyond life, those are all metaphors. But they stand for this psychology of feelings of extreme weakness spawning, creating in him a compulsive desire to strike back. Therefore, in a situation of uh, everyday life in which uh, someone is, does him a wrong, whereas another person might react to being wrong, Nietzsche can't afford to do it. If he allows himself the feeling of striking back against uh, the wrongdoing committed him, if he says, I'm innocent, and this was a wrong, and I shall retaliate, any of the thoughts of retaliation, and, uh, and everything he explores is a thought of retaliation, uh, entrenching himself as, as uh, entitled not to be wrong, equal rights as the presupposition not to be wrong, all of those thoughts, as they occur to him, he is able to identify as the thoughts of retaliation, if I give in to any of those thoughts, that, that weakness that I inherited from my father will get worse. And I will not just be walking with one foot beyond life, I'm going to be walking with one and a half foot beyond life, I'm going to be walking with both feet beyond life. I'm going to so, uh, in, in, so further deteriorate the inherited psychology of my father that I'm not going to be able to get out of bed. I'm going to be so consumed and burned up by feelings of vengefulness and vindictiveness. And in fact, he tells you that that happens to him. He said, at a certain point, this is in Eke Homo Y6, he says, you know, at a certain point, feelings of resentment were overwhelming me. I was a wreck. I was such a wreck, I couldn't leave my apartment. He'd become housebound. Here's why. He said, you know, I was so consumed. This is in Eke Homo, why, Eke Homo, why I am so wise, section six. He says, uh, in periods of uh, 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 in which I was not very strong, and I was being eaten up by feelings of vengefulness and vindictiveness, and I was slipping further and further into this period, of, into this side of decline in myself. Uh, I, I, I could, 
couldn't even leave the house. I couldn't leave the house because I couldn't separate. If I started thinking about leaving the house, it would be because I wasn't happy in the house. Or if I, if I, I wouldn't change my apartment. Because if I started thinking about changing my apartment, it would be because I wasn't happy with my apartment the way it is. Or if I made new friends, it would be because I wasn't happy with the friends that I had. In other words, I was so consumed with the thought of, of, of vengefulness and striking back that I, I had to prevent myself from letting anything be different. Because the moment I, I accepted that things could be different, I opened myself up to a whole hatred of things being the way they are. So I accepted that my apartment had to be the way it is. I can't change this apartment. I have to accept that this is the apartment I have to be in, and I can't change it for a bigger one, or a nicer one, or an area one, or a roomier one, or a prettier outlook review one. I have to be in this apartment. I can't change it. Because the moment I think I can change it, I open myself up to the overall feeling that things should be different, and the overall feeling for me of things being different is not easy, the way it is for other people who can do things normally and change in a regular pattern and not disrupt their lives. For me, to want things to be different is associated with a, a violent condemnation for things being the way they are. So I must discipline myself to feeling that the apartment that I'm in is the only one I can be in. Can't change my apartment. Can't change my friends. Can't change uh, uh, what, I, what I eat or how I eat or the restaurants I go to. I can't, I must take everything that comes to me as, as necessary and unchangeable. I'm that far gone. That's a very extreme psychological state. And it says what I just said in so many words in Eke Homo Y6. I had to take everything as necessary because I was so uh, vulnerable to the feeling of renunciation that the moment I allowed myself to think things could be different, I would open myself up into a wholesale hatred for everything the way it is. Then why can't everything be different? Why does every, anything have to be the way it is? I hate everything. I hate life. I hate the world. So this is a guy who's psychologically on the edge and having to fight against feelings in, in Wise 6 that I talked about, feelings of renunciation, in Wise 5, feelings of retaliation. I don't strike back. Okay. So what I did was, instead of, as I explored the, uh, the, the wrong committed to me and the feelings that I began to have, I noticed that the idea of equal rights, uh, equal entitlement not to be wronged, the rage and fury and frenzy over uh, innocence wronged, all of those thoughts belong to the psychology of retaliation. And I had to control all of those thoughts and master them. And I mastered them by taking the guilt for the wrong upon myself. Not because I was generous, not because I was kind, not because I was good, but because it created life in me. Because that was the way I mastered that weakness. So the God come to earth is the God of guilt who is a god of guilt because, by being so, he masters retaliation and so is creating life in himself. So the god like this is the opposite of the Christian god of the other world. The god likeness of Nietzsche is the god likeness of the world, of the, be, of the, of the this world, where to be godlike, and Nietzsche does in different places equate the idea of the godlike with the idea of a new nobility. So it's not really an idea of God. Uh, but the idea of godlikeness or a new nobility is an idea of the here and now evolving into becoming more richly and abundantly alive. And that's why I'm doing it. There's no morality here at all. We are done with any of the standard conceptions of guilt punishment, innocence. We manipulated those concepts completely as if they had no meaning whatsoever, and we manipulated them as if they had entirely and exclusively a psychological content, which is what he believes, 
And he discovers that in the correct manipulation of that psychological content, I can transform myself from a being of declining life into a being of growing and developing life. Now, let's go back. So I do, I do that. So there I was, and uh, I had this situation of a wrong done to me, and I mastered my feelings of, that came to me from my father, the, the feelings of uh, weakness that led to wanting to retaliate. I mastered those feelings, and, and instead of following the, the footsteps of my internal father, I, I, who, whose footsteps would have led me to further decline and decay and deterioration, I didn't follow those footsteps. Instead, I seized that moment and I mastered those footsteps. And out of that, out of that psychology from my father, I I stopped it and I I, I turned it in the direction of creating life for myself. And what was the first sentence of Eke Homo Wise Five? In another respect, too, I am just being my father once again, and as it were, is con the continuation of his life after an all too early death. In other words, I carry in myself my epigenetic father. That epigenetic psychology inherited from him, or the psychology associated with the epigenetics that I inherited from my father, lead me by their nature, by their dy dynamic, into a further and further and further decline. That is my father and myself. I stopped that from happening and took that father and myself and out of that decline, I added life, I created life. Instead of that, and so I can kind of in a loving way say, I took my epigenetic father who was, whose, whose destiny was to die young and I seized it, I seized control of that psychology and I made him to live in me instead of dying in me. Now, I don't know what more evidence you could have of the idea that Nietzsche is carrying around his epigenetic father than that sentence, in light of what, it, what the rest of it says in Wise 5. I took the guilt upon myself. I did not give in to resentment as I was inclined to. And by not doing that, I seized control of the declining uh, psychology that came to me from the epigenetic inheritance from my father, and I reversed that psychology, and as it were, I made the, 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 the death-inclining psychology of my father stop and make it come alive. Now that is one very scary guy. I carry my epigenetic father in myself, and I introspect, and I notice that I was able to, in a way, in a kind of loving remark, I, I, I kind of did what he couldn't do. Poor guy. He had no choice. Maybe because of his brain damage, or maybe for other reasons, I'm not exploring that. He says that he doesn't say he explores that. He doesn't say anything more. But for whatever reasons, his father does not. But I need to, am able to, and I can, I can, I can extend life after, the, after he was consumed in that psychology at the age of 36. Now that is why it's five, and it is an amazingly rich, complex, brilliant piece of philosophical and empirical writing. Philosophical and empirical. Um, because if any of this psychology is true, it's true as a matter of empirical fact. And if it has a biological foundation, as psychology must, then there's a biology behind it, which we just haven't discovered the make workings of. But clearly, the, uh, the area of modern science that explores what's being said here is epigenetics. OK. Any questions? Anyone appropriately terrified by what a wild guy this is? A pretty scary guy. Right? And, it's, and in the process, so in the process of doing that, of, of undoing the 
psychology of my epigenetic father, I discovered for the first time the real truth behind the psychology of Christianity and its ideas of innocence and punishment and the frenzy that it gets itself whipped up in with the idea that the innocent is being punished. Uh, and, and, it, and, it, and it makes that concept of innocence supremely innocent. There's no more meaning to the Christian idea of, of Jesus as free from the stain of original sin than to construct for itself the maximally, most maximally con uh, extended concept of innocence so that it can, it can be as full of hatred for the innocence being punished. And I understood that psychology and I, un and I, and I understood it as just a psychology there is no reality called innocence. There is no reality of punishment. Those are all illusions. It's just the human mind. And I took that human mind and turned it on its head. And what I discovered in the process, I made myself more alive. So what does that tell you about that frenzy of Christianity, of Christian psychology? It tells you that it's feeding off feelings of resentment and hatred of life. It's negative. It's declining. It's destructive. To the only thing that there is, worth having, which is being alive. So the whole philosophy is, it's really not even philosophy, it's biology. It says this is the, this is the psychobiology associated with ascending life. This is the psychobiology associated with the destruction of life. And he'll tell you that in so many words. I stand for the path of ascending life, and here is the path of declining life. I created life for myself, except we really we haven't had biologists pay any attention to it. And that's what we need. Okay. Back to section four. <clears throat> I, 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 I only visited section four short briefly because in it he makes a remark about pity and says, pity has intruded on my right to a heavy guilt. And I said, we don't we don't get in pity for whatever reason I don't know. He doesn't develop it in pity, but in, in wise four, he waits until wise five to talk about this idea of a God come to earth taking upon himself the guilt. So, but when we read back to wise four, what we're supposed to understand is that very complicated, so this gets so complicated, so psychologically rich, it's the most psychologically rich content I, I think we have. In wise four, he says, okay, I took upon myself a heavy guilt. But now I know what that means. That was the heavy guilt of fighting retaliation. Now, I, the more of that guilt I have taken upon myself, the more I'm undoing the psychology of retaliation, the more I'm creating life in myself. So here I have this heavy guilt. Ah, and along comes pity. For my guilt. Now, pity shows up in a couple of cases over guilt, and this is no accident. Uh, Nietzsche, in one of his notes, calls himself the last Oedipus. Oedipus is the character of ancient Greek mythology and the subject of Sophocles' three plays, the Thebian plays. And, uh, at least according to Aristotle, and Nietzsche wrote against Aristotle's interpretation of Oedipus, this is kind of a long way around to not such a complicated point, for uh, viewers of the tragedy of Oedipus, I think in Aristotle's mind, once we see that Oedipus realized the terrible crime he committed of killing his father and marrying his mother, and he is crushed as no man has been crushed, with this overwhelming, heavy, completely devouring guilt, we should feel pity for poor Oedipus' guilt. So pity and guilt have floated around together and were dating for a long time before, <laughs> before Nietzsche came along. Another good case of pity and guilt is in a play of Shakespeare's called Othello. And Othello gets tricked into killing his young wife Desdemona because he is he's de deceived into believing that she's unfaithful to him. And he kills her. And, uh, and then the truth comes out. And there he is uh, in a long final scene of the play and realizes that he killed Desdemona and he's screaming, Oh, devils take me, roast me in salt.
sulfur wash me in, in steep down gulfs of liquid fire. And we're supposed to feel sorrowful and pitying for the terrible guilt that uh, Othello must feel having recognized that he wrongfully killed his faithful young wife, whom he dearly loved. Okay. So pity is, it, it has a, 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 in literature, seeks to, in some cases, arouse pity for suffering and guilt, for the suffering of guilt. So, in, here's this Nietzsche's situation, and he says, here I am, enduring this heavy guilt, but the heavy guilt as I explained it in Wise Five, which was uh, a mastery of the feelings of retaliation, so the heavier the guilt, the more mastery I have over those feelings of retaliation, the more abundantly alive I am, and along comes pity intruding upon my heavy guilt, wanting me not to feel guilty. And I want to say, wait a second, you're missing something. The, the more guilty I feel here, the more ritually alive I am. There's something you're not understanding about this guilt. You want me, you want to feel pity for it, and want me to maybe uh, not suffer this terrible guilt so much as I'm suffering it. Maybe be a little easier on myself. Oh, we feel sorry for your guilt. Oh, you don't have to feel so guilty. Oh, it's not, it's your fault, but oh, we feel bad for you. And Nietzsche wants to say, with friends like you, who needs enemies? You are intruding destructively on what is in fact the, a path of ascending life in my heavy guilt and trying to undo that heavy guilt, in fact, lure me away from it. It's not exactly easy to do. It's a terrible stress on me to overcome my retaliation and take upon myself the guilt for the wrongdoing of another when every fiber of me wants to say, no, I'm innocent, I'm entitled not to be wronged, I have equal rights, I was in the right, I was in the right. So every second in my mind that I'm taking upon myself the, uh, the guilt, there's another part of my mind saying, but I'm right, but I'm right, but I'm right, but I'm right. And I have to fight that. And along comes pity and, and, and trying to make me back away from the suffering that I'm enduring by feeling guilty. And Nietzsche says what that shows me is that pity is not on the side of ascending life. Pity is only attracted to me in this situation because it's trying to undermine my effort. Pity is trying to destroy the effort of, of mastery. It's, it's seeing the strengthening of life in me and it wants that to stop. Pity really conceals a psychology of, re of wanting to see life hurt and crippled. And in this situation, uh, life is being strengthened, and pity doesn't like to see that. Pity wants me to back off, pity wants me to feel sorry for myself, uh, to uh, not endure that suffering of this guilt so much, like we would say to poor Othello, oh, you know, you were led into believing these things about Desdemona, and it's, it's yes, you're guilty, but it's really not your fault. Or we might say to poor Oedipus, Oedipus, you know, the gods put this fate upon you, and it's really not entirely your fault. So pity wants to say to Nietzsche, no, no, and you shouldn't feel this terrible guilt. And Nietzsche is saying, if you feel that, if you're trying to make me back away from my guilt, then your motivation must be to see that the life that I'm strengthening by having this guilt gets crippled. So the, the claim is, in Wise 4, that he's unmasked, unmasked the psychology of pity to reveal that its true intention is to uh, keep life in a state of being crippled and hurt, and that it gets angry and tries to intrude and disrupt processes that strengthen life. That's a terrible uh, attack on pity. I mean, pity is the foundation of modern society. It's been the foundation since Rousseau. And for Nietzsche to uh, come along here and say, look, I, 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 I'm telling you, I know concretely what my experience of guilt is. 
And I know concretely, as, an, as my empirical experience, that when pity intruded upon that experience of suffering and guilt, it was trying to get me to back away from the direction of strengthening life. So why, why would I trust pity? That means that pity must have a hidden agenda to see life crippled and maimed and destroyed. And when it sees life being strengthened, it shows up and tries to disrupt the strengthening processes. Wow. Too scary? Huh? Okay. It's pretty scary, though. Oh, let me close this. Okay. Now, just a little more and then we'll go. Uh, let me see. I'll just read a little bit, but I don't, I don't want to closely comment until uh, <laughs> uh, until about here. All right. This is Rise 4. Like Rise 5, it opens with a reference to his father. And just as in Rise 5, the reference to his father is an integrated meaning of that whole complicated section. Uh, so it is in Wise 4, it's, it's integrated with this whole uh, section. So <clears throat> we won't get all, all of it today. But I've never understood the art of uh, taking against me. That means of, of arousing people's uh, animosity toward me. I have my incomparable father to thank for that too. We'll have to, we'll have, in, it, the word really is translated correctly as incomparable. Uh, we're having no, 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 nothing, no, nothing similar to, but we'll have to see how, how he means that. Is it satire, is it sarcasm, or is it just meant literally? And I'll answer that. Uh, I've thought of lots of different things about this. I have my incomparable father to thank for that too, even when it seemed to me of great value. Um, we'll skip that. My experience is, even of those of whom everyone else has bad experiences, and this is, so remember that half of the sentence, my experiences, even with those of whom everyone else has bad experiences, speak without exception in their favor. My experiences, even of those people that everybody else has bad experiences of, my experiences say good things about them. Huh? There's not a line in this. It's a book of enormous nuances. Every line and every word has is nuanced. What are you talking about? I tame every bear. I make even the buffoons mind their manners. How do you do that? So I tame every bear means every unruly, nasty, growly, grumbly, hostile person, when I get around them, I tame them. It's amazing. Uh, uh, goofy guys, goofy people, buffoons who are uh, silly and ridiculous and always clowning around and can't be serious or are uh, uh, just uh, um, very simple-minded and, and, and can't get a, 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 a solid grip on any piece of reality or any piece of humanity. I even make them mind their manners. In seven years, I taught Greek in the grammar school at Basel. I never had to punish anybody. The laziest students worked hard for me. This is amazing, <laughs> right? You start to, what's the deal? See, once you start actually thinking you can read it, then you really want to read it. And that's the key, that's the, that's the addictive point. Most people don't get to that first spot. They just say, I can't make any sense out of it, and they move on to other works. But once you realize that you can understand this, then you really start wanting to, because it's fascinating to unravel. I am always a match for any chance occurrence. That, that would be better to be, it, 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 I'm going to uh, recommend the translation, I am always equal to any chance event. I need to be unprepared to be master of myself. Let's stop there. Okay. Uh, somehow, uh, why do I have to be unprepared? Let's say, let's leave it right here. 
Um, or or let's, let's just look at right here. I need to be unprepared to be master of myself. What does that mean? Well, anything to do with the idea of mastery means has, some, has a reference to mastering uh, the compulsive feelings to strike back or to renounce. So I have to be unprepared in order to keep control of my feelings of, in this case, wanting to renounce. So we have bears and we have buffoons. Well, if I allow myself to, I will take an unruly, uh, uh, nasty, hostile, uh, growly, grumbly person that everyone hates and I will uh, take it further than the normal person and my compulsion to renounce will make, will make that person for me an occasion to renounce everyone and everything. So I have to control renouncing. And buffoons, if I let myself, I will get so negative over someone being kind of a jerk and being not serious, not being able to have a serious thought, that I will let that person uh, occupy my mind so much that uh, I, I will just sink into an, a pit of negativity about not just him, but it'll spread and spread and I'll hate and want nothing to do with the human race. So, I have to stay, I, I have to remain unprepared to be master of myself means this. I, I haven't quite filled in all the steps, but that's all right. He means, uh, if I have expectations, my expectations will just set me up for more disappointments. You know, I expected my students all to get A's <laughs> on, on the Midsummer Night's Dream Year 2 exam. And they did. I'm so disappointed. I'm so full of negativity. I'm so and so on. So instead of doing that, I don't have any expectation whatsoever. I don't, I don't saddle myself with expectations because if I do, then they're only going to be disappointed and I can't handle that. A normal person could just kind of, okay, I was a little disappointed and no big deal. But me, with my extreme susceptibility to the wanting to uh, renounce, hate the world, hate life, hate living things, hate the circumstance of being alive, my extreme tendency in that direction, if I, if I saddle myself with an expectation and the expectation isn't met, I'll just go crazy over that and allow myself to think about it and think about it and think about it and fill myself up with lots and lots and lots of, ne of negativity. So I, my control over that whole psychology is, I don't expect anything. I have no expectations. It will be whatever it will be. I don't have to have it be this. I don't expect that outcome, I don't expect the other outcome, it just has to be whatever it is. And now he says, uh, I, I am always the equal of any chance event. That's not so easy. Um, very few people can do that. I really have to control myself. It's the same idea. Well, though I haven't mentioned, I, 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 keep, I keep reading it as the equal, and I, I'll explain why in a minute, instead of always a match. I keep reading it as always the equal, and I'll explain why in a minute. But this is that same idea uh, of a chance event. Chance event comes along, and hey, I never renounce. This went wrong. No, nah, I wouldn't call it wrong. It just is. So I never allow any accident to come into my day and denounce it or take it as an occasion to renounce and to curse and swear and to renounce life. And me, I am equal to it. Now, this idea of equality, like so many terms in Nietzsche and what makes Eke Homo a deceptive work, lots of its language seem to be, seems to be just uh, colloquial, everyday uh, 
on technical language, non-technical language. But as you read lots and lots and lots and lots of Nietzsche, it turns out that a lot of the language has a semi-technical meaning. And much of the semi-technical meaning is put forth in the work that he declined to publish called The Will to Power. Uh, and there are all kinds of problems about uh, how to appropriately use the will to power because he, he chose not to publish it. On the other hand, the, the book that he was going to publish instead, called The Revaluation of All Values, would have contained pretty much the same material. So it, it, isn't, it isn't as if he chose not to publish The Will to Power because we were sure he rejected those ideas. I, I wouldn't think so, but the fact is he didn't publish those ideas and that is a little disturbing. But there's no other way to make sense out of equality. Here in lies four, I am equal to any chance event. I must be unprepared to be master of myself. And in Y7, equality before the enemy is the first presupposition, he says, of an honest duel. We haven't read Y7, but the concept of equality appears in Y4 and in Y7. Look at these sentences here. This sentence. Uh, WP is a reference to the uh, standard edition or what has become known as the standard edition of the Will to Power, <coughs> which contains 1,000 and, I don't remember, 65, uh, something like that, aphorisms, and which is a complete forgery. Nietzsche never wrote it. He was not uh, 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 in his right mind when it was compiled. His editors put it together, and it is not, uh, it, 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 it individually, the sentences are his, but the ordering is not. And when you, if you read it, you have a natural tendency to read it as if one thing followed upon another thing, but it's an editor's plan that that one thing be read to have followed upon the other thing, not Nietzsche's. So it, it's absolutely unreliable, uh, worthless, as a book, but as what we can use it as uh, the uh, English translation, of, of certain uh, fragments that he wrote from the German. That's nothing wrong with doing that. So, it, it, at, in this particular section in the standard English edition of The Will to Power, numbered 656, and there are ways that I can show you where that particular line appears in the German editions and all that, it's not too important. But he writes this, not too important at the moment, anyway. The will to power can manifest itself only against the resistance. It seeks after that which resists it. And then, a little later on, he says, it can be shown very clearly that every living thing does everything it can not to just preserve itself, but to become more. Now, in this, I'm trying to think about this line that he is the equal to any chance event. Chance is very difficult for him to deal with. What he wants to do is is renounce and not accept chance as just what it is. He wants to make chance blamable. He wants to not, uh, he wants, he wants instead of chance, he wants there to be uh, malevolence against him or the world going the wrong way or some wickedness of life instead of chance as just the innocent thing that it is. So when confronted with a, the unexpected, he, his tendency is to take the unexpected as a thwarting of his plan or screwing up of his life, ruining of his day. To be equal to the chance event is an equality of psychological force. And I'll skip all that. Resistance must be equal. Everything that will grow and develop life in me requires that I pit myself against resistance. That's what, that's what life wants to do. It seeks out resistances so that it can strengthen itself. And it can't just strengthen itself against the resistance that it can easily conquer. There's no strengthening in that. 
in order for life to strengthen itself against resistance, the resistance has to be equal to whatever uh, the level of life it is at the time that I'm encountering it. Level of life is not exactly a clear idea, but I think he has the idea that at, at different times you can call yourself more richly alive, less richly alive, periods of weakness, periods of decline, periods of ascending life. Makes a little sense. Uh, at any given moment, life in me is at a certain spot, and if I want it to grow, I have to find something to fight against, and the thing that I have to fight against must be its equal. So that if my, if my problem is uh, vulnerability to feelings of renunciation, then for me to grow life in myself, I have to identify where I am at a given moment of aliveness, and then find a resistance to, that is uh, an equal resistance to that moment of aliveness, or to that degree of aliveness, and then conquer that resistance. And then if I successfully conquer it, I have grown in more in life. Resistance must be equal. <clears throat> these letters refer to the German edition. You can actually copy these down if you want, or you can look at the tape later. Uh, but I can show you how to find all of these sentences online. So all of everything, every, 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 everything Everything that has the letters KSA uh, can be correlated to an online edition of Nietzsche's works in German. Everything that looks like this is the English translation. This we're not going to bother with. Okay. So, at, at this location, which you can find online, he says that in order for a growth of life to occur by, the encou by encountering a resistance, that resistance must be equal. The idea of an equal resistance, against which alone the will to power can extend its command over life weakening, occurs in wise four. That's what we said. He said, hey, I am equal to any chance event. In other words, a chance event comes my way and, and uh, it is very, very, very dangerous for me because chance gets in the way of my plans and uh, in encourages in me feelings of renunciation. Uh, but I don't take that route mentally when confronted with a chance event. Instead, I force myself to be the equal of chance. That is to say, I, I confront chance with, uh, uh, I, I confront the threat of chance with an equal richness of life. So that chance does not, the occurrence of chance does not have the effect on me of making me spiral into uh, an abyss of renunciation because I didn't get things to work out the way I wanted to and I'm angry that the world isn't what I want it to be. Rather, I accept chance as uh, an inevitable part of life. I don't take it as an occasion to renounce. But all of that acceptance means that I have to uh, confront the threat posed by chance with an equal richness of life. Resistance must be equal. The idea of an equal resistance against which the, I, and, and only against an equal resistance can the will to power, I haven't used that phrase much, but only against an equal resistance can he uh, exert command over the life weakening of uh, renunciation that would occur from a chance event disrupting my plans. And what more importantly, as we haven't looked at yet, it occurs in my uh, seven. But this question arises, and we can stop here because this is quite a lot. How do I know what my equal opponent is? <laughs> that, I have to tell you, I, I probably asked this question Oh, I don't know. It was on my mind for I don't know how long. But I think I went from 1996 until about uh, 2009 before I found this. <laughs> and it bothered me. Every six months or so, I'd go around and I'd say, I haven't figured that out yet. I've got to figure this out. 
And, and, and the, the problem is the answers are all given in the, in the world of power. So, uh, and I don't know what to make of that fact. There's, there's quite a lot of controversy over how to use the world of power, but the fact is the answers to this occur in the world of power. The answers to this issue of politics. How do I know who my equal opponent is? And he does give you the answer. In this is a reference to the notebooks that are the will of power. Anything that is KSA 11 and 12 is the will of power. The will of power interprets, he says, it identifies a that in the other which it faces as its equal. At least it's an answer. At least he knows there's a problem there. A little further on, he writes, one must add, so who interprets? Instead, the interpreting, as a form of, the interpreting is as a form of the will to power itself has existence. Okay, maybe not entirely clear because they're just notes. But he's, he, 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 he has the idea that the will to power, in seeking a resistance, the, the thing that it finds as a resistance may not in, be in and of itself an actual resistance. It's not like I have to go around the world and measure something against myself. But at any given moment, the, the, uh, the will to power in me will make something, focus on something about a situation to make it equal to my level of aliveness. So I, I, make, I say, ah, that resist me. So I interpret the thing myself as the equal resistance. It isn't necessarily equal in and of itself. Nothing outside of my scope of interpretation comes into consideration. Just within my scope of interpreting, that other thing is for me, at this particular moment of aliveness, an equal resistance. That's at least the makings of an answer. So I don't have to go around the world trying to find an equal resistance to the uh, degree of aliveness that I have at any given moment to stress myself and maximize my aliveness by exercising against resistance. I just have to wander around and that will automatically happen by the drive of life itself because it, it, it wants so badly to be strengthened.